got a question to ask. So this is going to be the next three months. This is the first of a new series on Galatians. And it's going to be a challenging series. And it's going to be a big blessing, I think. I'm come today with questions to set us on our way. And I think it would be very useful if we all had a New Testament. Nothing I'm going to say is going to be contentious. Everything will be amen, but it won't be easy. Okay? So if you, I know nowadays most people have it on their phone, but if you haven't got a, a, a Bible, it'd be great to have one. There's, um, ben will go round. My question to begin the whole session is what could really make God angry with you? What really makes God angry? Now, in the death of Jesus, God has made known that he wants to forgive all people everywhere. He wants to bless all people everywhere. He wants to transform our lives, all people everywhere. But what really makes God angry, despite this heart? Let's ask it another way. What made Jesus angry? Who was Jesus angry with? Why was he angry? What made Paul angry? That's Galatians. Who was he angry with and why? Galatians is our study for the next three months. All scripture is God-breathed. In some sense, that means that all scripture was written for us. But in another sense, of course, it wasn't written for us. It was written in another language 1,900 years ago. So we read it through their ears. And sometimes we say, no, that's not for us, that's for them. And sometimes we say, that's for us. That's the question for Galatians. If Galatians is for us, this is going to be a challenging and possibly life-changing series. Let's go for the next slide. No, let's not go for the next slide. Let's go for a challenge then. Why is this? I, go, I printed out the first nine verses. And have a look at the first nine verses as I pass them round. Yes, go for it, go for it. Have a look at the first nine verses. What I've done is a very literal translation here. Your translation that you have before you will be very good, I'm sure. And my translation's more literal. I'll read it. From Paul, an apostle. Has everyone got one? You can, you can share with your neighbor if I haven't printed enough. I didn't want to kill too many trees. Paul, an apostle, not by humans nor through a human, but through Jesus Christ and through Father God, who raised him from the dead, and from all brothers and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the meeting groups of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from Father God and our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who gave himself for our sins in order to bring us out of the current evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory to the ages of the ages. Amen. I am astounded that you are so quickly turning from the one who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel. It is not another. Instead, certain people are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if ourselves or an angel from heaven were to preach a gospel beside the one which we did preach to you, let him be cursed. As we said before, and now I am saying again, if anyone preaches a gospel other than the one you received, let him be cursed. Okay, I apologize for the drama. I shall now explain it in reasonable tones. If you're speaking today, there are ways of speaking, particularly in media and TV. In the days of Jesus and Paul, there wasn't TV uh, or even amplification. People spoke. And there was an idea of speaking to effect. Particularly if you're in a court and your life depends on it, you've got to make it work. And there is a code, ways to make it effective. People said, to be a good speaker, you have to connect with your audience. You have to have some passion, some pathos. You've got to have something to say. You've got to have a logos. You've got to have a content. It's got to be logical. And it's got to impact people so that they change. So there's an ethical element, an ethos. So whatever you do in your talk, you have these three things throwing in your mind. Let's call them passion, content, and action. Heart, soul, and spirit. As there's thousands of books written. People would learn these. And they would learn how to write a letter. And Paul's letters follow the same pattern. All bar one. Galatians. They all start with from. You start off by telling who you are. I know in British letters sometimes you put yourself right at the end, but then you don't know who it is so you get to the end. Hopefully you know before, but by the handwriting. Who knows? Um, from, and then you do too. You still think about this passion, ethos, and logos. You still say you want to say who, are you, who you are and somehow connect with your audience. The same with uh, when you're talking too. And then you send a greeting. Peace to you all. Right? And then you have a prayer. Um, prayer for the recipient. And then after you've done your prayer, and your prayer could be a short prayer or a long prayer, you then move to your argument. You make a, a statement. This is what I'm going to write the letter about. So classically, uh, from Danny to mum, who I love, um, grace to you, uh, peace to you. I pray for you to the God of whatever. We can go for God of Jesus. We can go for God of whatever. Um, please send me money. <laughs> And then you go from there, you go to your reasons why. Because I really need it. And then you go to the reasons why it would be a mistake not to send me money. Because if you don't, I'm going to start stealing. And then you summarize your thing. So, Mum, I really do need money. And then you finally say, and so lots of love and peace and blessings and my prayers to you. Okay, that's how you get money from your mum in Greece. Okay, So, when you look at Paul's letters, hence you've got your Bibles before you, you will see this pattern. So just have a look, and let's go for the next slide, and having got the, the Greek things. So Paul's letters to other churches go from two greetings and a prayer. So let's look up Romans. If you can, look it up in your phone, and you look at Romans, and then let's click on there, and we find out that for Romans, he gives nine verses to the prayer, from two greetings, and then nine verses. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world, and on he goes for another nine verses. Next one, 1 Corinthians. Get your fingers going, have a look. That's the next one in the New Testament. Now they go following the order, 1 Corinthians. And in this one, he has just... Six verses. I give thanks to my God. From two greetings then, I give thanks to God. Always. I give thanks always for you. 
Okay? And then in 2 Corinthians, he also does from 2 and... Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father who consoles me. And he gives a whole nine verses again to a, to a prayer. Then we move on to, we're well, skipping Galatians, we move on to Ephesians. Ephesians. He doesn't give just one verse to the prayer, not just one chapter to the prayer, but he's still praying. If you look in chapter 3, you've got an Amen in verse 21. Yeah, verse 18, I pray that you have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the width and the length and the height and the depth of the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so, you may be, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So he's got three chapters just to prayer. And then he says, mum, send me some, some money or something. <laughs> Philippians is actually a mum, send me some money one. So Philippians, he... Uh, Let's go. Philippians has nine verses for a prayer, and he thanks for already sending money. Thank you for already sending money. And I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy. Colossians, same thing. One whole chapter. In our prayers for you, always we thank God. And in chapter two, he's still praying for them and telling them how he much he connects. The same for Thessalonians. Should we go Thessalonians? Put that on there. We always give thanks to God. Nine verses. And two Thessalonians. We all, must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters. Okay. So, why does Paul not pray for the Galatians? Why? You've got from, you've got to, you have cold greetings, and then no prayer. The answer, see if it works, is, 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 So the big question, the big question is, next slide please, why is Paul so angry? What is it that makes Paul so angry? Because we know that this is what will make God angry with us. We're going to spend three months answering that question. <laughs> okay, three months. That is the context. So I've now set the context, so I now can sit down with Hazel if you uh, said no more than 20 minutes, but you want me to keep going. She's going to give me a signal if I have to stop. Right. We're halfway through. Okay, so why? Okay, so I'm going to, again, I'm, I'm not going to give you the answer for the next three months because that's, you know, you'll stop going to church. Well, maybe there are other things to come to church for. <laughs> But what I'll do is just give a background to that, uh, that question. Why? Okay. So another question then. Next slide, please. What was the biggest issue facing the New Testament church? Okay. What was the biggest issue facing the New, the, the New Testament church the first hundreds of years, from maybe A.D. 35 to A.D. 135? Yes? What was the biggest issue that they faced? Well, you can have a discussion on that, can't you? Okay, let's go a bit closer to think of how we could answer it. Why did Luke write Acts? I don't mean what is Acts about. We've done some studies on Acts, and that's what Acts is about. The question is, why did Luke write Acts? What was he trying to achieve when he wrote Acts? Yeah. How you can work out what someone's trying to achieve is what they tell you and then what they don't tell you. Okay? He writes a history of the church. But if he wrote a history of the church, I mean, if he wrote a history of Jesus, all the books of the world would not be enough to fill that story. You have to choose things to say. 
If he told the story of every single apostle, volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes, it wouldn't be enough. So he chooses particular things to say. And it's really interesting what he chooses to say. Next slide, please. He starts off with all the world in Jerusalem. Jesus goes up and uh, taken to heaven. And the Holy Spirit comes down. And interestingly, all the world is in Jerusalem. And there's blessing. And Peter heals. And Peter preaches. And people are blessed, uh, uh, are, are blessed and come to faith. But then he chooses to say that there was an argument. Why does he choose that? And he even chooses that the argument was about serving tables. Because the Hebrew speaking and the Greek speaking had problems with serving tables. The 12 Hebrew speaking apostles, it was found, weren't enough to solve the problem. Why is he picking that? Seven leaders were appointed to fix the problem. It just so happens that all these seven leaders had Greek names. Why stop telling about the blessing to give us that? What's going on? One of them, Stephen, was amazingly used by God and killed. And then there was an incredible persecution that broke out in the whole world. But all the leaders with Hebrew names were able to study in Jerusalem. What's going on there? And through this persecution, the gospel comes to the whole world. Okay, next slide, please. Sounds very good, isn't it? Like... Going on, Saul led the persecution. But Saul had an amazing conversion. Saul's conversion was approved by Jerusalem. He met with all the leaders in Jerusalem. And then James was killed. Peter was put in prison. Peter escaped from prison. Paul preached. In Paul's preaching, there was a dispute. The big issue, the, re the thing that we're trying to work out. Why did Luke write this? And the very center of the book of Acts is the Council of Jerusalem. All meeting together to discuss the problem and working it out and coming up with a consensus. This is the answer. Yeah? It's the center. Before the Council of Jerusalem, the story is Peter, Stephen, Paul, Peter, Paul. After the Council of Jerusalem, Paul does miracles. Paul's conversion is retold. Paul preaches. Paul is put in prison. Paul's conversion is retold again. Three times. If I want to say something important, I'll say it again. And if I say it again, I'll really annoy you. And again and again. Yeah? Paul's conversion is told three times. Paul fills the whole of that rest of the time. It gets so much Paul that forget about all the blessings and healings that are going on in the world with all the other disciples. We just are interested about Paul going to prison and waiting in prison and how that's going to sort. Yeah? Paul's prison adventure becomes the only interest. So Luke's account of the acts of some of the apostles was written so that you would know this. Okay. So we're wise to choose Galatians. Okay. We're super wise to choose Galatians. So what is, next one, what is the big issue? Okay. Galatians and Acts, I'll, I'll beat the front, do differ on a few things. 
Okay? Paul says, I never met any of the apostles. Luke says, he went straight to meet, to meet them all. Paul says, we had a fabulous meeting. Everything was agreed. But, so Luke says, Paul in Galatians says, I had a terrible falling out with Peter. I had to go to his face and say, you are wrong. Sorry, sorry for anyone I pointed out there was not. <laughs> okay. But they agree, Luke and Paul are 100% on what was the big issue. Now, I've nearly finished. Isn't that good? I'm not going to get time out. Good. Okay. So, what was the big issue? We're going to find out. Three months. Okay. Oh, can hardly wait. Two answers might be given. One's wrong and one's right. Okay. Paul is right in Galatians about salvation and discipleship. These were the big issues of the time. What must I do to be saved? Is that the issue? Is that the issue? The answer, what must I do to be saved, is absolutely nothing. Okay? Jesus has done it all. Yeah? So Sunday school, having the same lesson upstairs, Jesus is the answer. Yeah? Yeah? So the answer is absolutely nothing. God's grace, God's mercy is the only way of salvation. You can't do anything. Yeah? You can believe in Jesus. Okay? Do the Hebrew-speaking uh, Jews disagree with that? No. 100% of them, well, if they're following God, <laughs> would say that to be saved, it is an act of God. Do the Greek-speaking Jews agree with that? 100%. They are completely together. Okay? In terms of Old Testament theology, if they, if they are rabbis, they would know that Israel was saved from Egypt before they got the law. Yes? Before they got the law, they were saved. Didn't know anything. The law was given after they were saved. Greek-speaking Jews and Hebrew-speaking Jews had no problem on salvation by grace alone. That is not the big issue. Okay? So as we go through the, ser the sermon series, just remember that one. Okay? So what is the big issue? Well, it's salvation and discipleship. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's click again. Let's find out what it is. Okay. What must I do to stay in God's salvation? How do I enter? Jesus. The answer is Jesus. Right. What must I do to stay in God's salvation? Do you want me to give you the answer? Come to church in the next three months. <laughs> okay. Key, another way, I, I will give you a little, little, little answer. A little answer. How do I, as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, Read the Old Testament. Those are all, when, God, when Paul said, all scripture is God breathed, it was just the Old Testament. The big issue is how do I read the Old Testament? How do I stay? In the, how do I enter the grace of God? Into the grace of God, Jesus has done everything. Okay, I'm so much wanting to tell you the answer, but I'm going to hold it back. Okay, <laughs> okay, I'll give you a clue. I've already told you it. What must I do to stay in God's salvation? How do you read the Old Testament? Okay, I've finished. But I want to close with a rabbi's prayer. Okay? Now I'm not sure if you're going to want to read this, want to, want to pray this, but you can. 
This is a rabbi's prayer, and I think it's an appropriate close to say, okay, this, this issue divided the church in the first century, and it still divides the church today. Okay? So it's a major issue. It's relevant. But let's go with the rabbi's prayer. This is a rabbi's prayer. Um, it's in synagogue every Sabbath. Master, we'll go for the next slide. Master of existence. Oh, okay, not that slide. Okay. No, we'll just, I was going to ask some dramatic why questions, but I won't. So let's go for the rabbi's prayer. Master of existence and Lord of lords. We do not rely on our own good deeds, but on your great mercy as we lay our needs before you. Lord, hear. Lord, pardon. Lord, listen and act. What are we? What is our life? What is our justice? What is our success? What is our righteousness? What is our strength? What are our heroics? Lord, our God, and God, God of our fathers, what can we say before you? For in your presence are not the powerful as nothing, the famous as if they had never existed, the learned as if without knowledge, and the intelligent as if without insight. To you, most of our actions are pointless and our daily life shallow. Even the superiority of man over beasts is nothing, for everything is trivial except the pure soul which must one day give, it, give its account and reckoning before the judgment seat of your glory. I finished. It's back to Hazel. How do you read the Old Testament? How do you stay in the salvation of God? The clue? How does the rabbi read the Old Testament? How did he stay in the grace of God? And Galatians? Any answer? other than Galatians, is let them be cursed. <laughs>